what we're going to do today is go through just a few Mark 10s um, and then just talk about all the different game theory concepts that are at play. Uh, we're going to dive into power solver. The goal of this is to look at a situation, um, develop strong habits and, and fundamentals such that you can apply these concepts to a bunch of different board textures, uh, a bunch of different situations that, that you're going to face in game. Um, so, yeah, let's let's uh, let's jump right in. Uh, first hand comes from a recent 25k. Uh, action force to the button. This guy raises. He's a strong player. Uh, we call king three of spades. Jack ten deuce. Rainbow check. About 25% pot, um, and that leads us to our first decision point. So, uh, I think this is a really good hand to show uh, how to construct check raise ranges, um, especially when we're facing a button open. Uh, because they're going to have a really wide range. They're going to be betting with a really wide range of hands. Um, and these situations come up all the time. And anytime you're dealing with really wide ranges, it's it's really difficult to defend versus aggression. right? So um, let's first talk about how we want to construct our check-raising range in this spot on Jack-10-2. So we have a really clear section of hands that that are easy to find, right? Our best jack apps, king jack, jack queen, jack nine, um, even jack eight's gonna be strong enough, and then it's gonna mix dip down from there with a the jack X. And then we have like a really um, natural draws. Our natural draws here are gonna be some eight nine, some queen nine, some king nine, right? Our gut shots are open ended straight draws. Um, but it's just not gonna be enough of hands to cut to give us board coverage on, on enough runouts. And so the third hand type that you're going to find in these spots is going to be one over card to the jack and backdoor flush draw type stuff, like the hand we have here. Uh, so I go for the check raise in the spot, and the opponent calls. So let, let's first look at this flop uh, in the solver and start looking at exactly what hands you're talking about. So two high card boards, button versus big blind, 40 bigs. is like a bread and butter spot. Um, it's just going to be a pure small bet from the opponent almost every time. Um, you can find a little bit of bigger bets with like queens, kings, and maybe a little bit of like king jack offsuit and stuff, but most people are just going to play a pure small bet strategy. Um, so after bet 25, here's our response to uh, to the small bet. As you can see, we're obviously going to raise our strong jack x. Um, and this is typical, right? It's like our best jack x, like king jack, we want to raise it every time. It's just, it's like the nuts on the board at the stack deck. Um, we need to put more money in the pot. Uh, and it might feel uncomfortable to be raising hands like jack-8, jack-7, jack-6, but the bottom line is you're, you're playing a button player who's opening a ton of hands, and they're betting their whole range. So they're betting pocket sevens. They're betting 10-8, right? So jack-8, when we have it, is it is an extremely high equity hand that we, we need to check raise and play aggressively. Um, so this this region here uh, is really common. We're going to be thin in this spot button versus big blind. So we have like the natural bluffs here, like queen-9, queen-8, king-9, um, and these are all very common, just mixed frequencies. You're going to play them as calls and check raises. You need to have board coverage on uh, both in your call range. That way when they barrel on a king or a queen, um, you can sometimes have straights. Uh, also, when you check raise, though, you need to have straights. So these ones are all pretty intuitive um, to check raise, right? But the less intuitive hands that you're going to see on all these board types, uh, and this happens just in almost every single big blind versus in position single raise pot, is going to be a single over card and then a low card that interacts with uh, with the bottom card. So in this spot, we're going to see like the queen three backdoor flush draw, the queen four, king four, king three. This hand type is going to be check raised uh, pretty frequently um, in, in these spots. And they just have good properties. You can imagine that if we only check raise a jack and, you know, intuitive draws, the open and straight draws, the gut shots, well, when draws complete on the turn, it's hard to find bluffs, right? So, so we only check raise jack x, sets two pairs, and queen nine. Well, on an eight turn, what are you going to bluff with, right? So these hands' purpose is to give you um, board coverage for high EV turns. Um, and that's why you're choosing a backdoor flush draw. Uh, you need the backdoor flush draw with it. And one other thing that's nice about having like a three and a four in your hand is you're not really blocking any of your opponent's offsuit foldings. Um, they're going to fold. So like when you check raise here, they're just going to fold like the king seven, king six, you know, ace eight, ace seven, ace six. So you're immediately kind of targeting their offsuit region of hands uh, to fold right away. 
And so having a three in your hand, obviously they're not opening all two threes. So that, that's kind of an important concept of having a low card in your hand with one over card. Um, and then having the king gives you, having the king or queen gives you really good equity against their jack x and their 10x, right? If we if we were to check raise a hand like um, nine, six suited, right? You're seeing it a tiny bit, it, but it doesn't make as much sense like king three, right? It's like, would we ever check raise seven, four just, just for for the heck of it, because if we get them to fold eight high, well, our equity isn't good enough on run-up. So you need to make sure you have an over card to the top pair, and then you want your second card to typically be pretty low and connected to the third, the, the third card on the board, which in this case is a deuce. Um, so this is just like a fundamental check-raising strategy. You're also going to see hands that interact with the bottom pair and this possible straight blockers on future streets. And so that's going to be like the queen to the nine to the 8-2. Um, these are bottom pair type hands that allow you to to, to do a lot with on future streets um, because you're going to have pertinent blockers on a lot of turn cards. So, so that would be like the the other portion of your check raising range besides um, the other ones we've talked about. So just to recap, big blind check raising range. You're going to take your value hands, right? Uh, those are the easy ones to find. When you have jack 10, you're going to check raise pure. When you have good top pair, you're going to check raise pure. Then you're going to take a mix of high equity draws that are more natural. Your queen nine, your king nine, um, your eight nine, etc. Uh, the third hand type that you're going to fit into a check raising strategy is going to be a single over card hand with a backdoor plus draw that you get to barrel on a lot of turns. That's going to be your queen three, your king three, um, even your ace three and ace four you're seeing gets in there a little bit. As the second card gets higher, like king six, king seven, you're doing less check raising because you're blocking more offsuit forwards from the opponent. Um, and then the fourth type is just going to be some smattering of bottom pair hands, typically when it interacts with future straight draws and has pertinent blockers. Uh, so that's kind of like the first range construction, a like deep range construction that, that we're going to look at here. So in the hand, we raise the king three, the opponent calls, we get the six of spades. And we need to figure out how we're going to now approach uh, this turn barrel spot after check raising the block. Um, and a very important like game theory rule and concept that you're going to find in these spots is that you have to turn equity uh, to barrel the turn. You don't always need to turn equity. You can have equity, but you need to have equity out of position when you barrel, which is a lot different than some in, in position spots. But when you check raise out of position, you let the button player fold his air, right? And so their range is already somewhat condensed, and so you need to have equity against their continuing range to be bluffing in the spot. So on rainbow boards, we're taking our backdoor flush draws that we just talked about in flop, and then when a turn brings a backdoor flush draw, it makes our life easy because we just barrel when we turn a flush draw, we check when we don't because we want to have that added equity. And then you're going to mix your um, your draws in the flop that retain their equity, like the 8-9, like the queen-9. Um, so let's look at that in the solver. Here's the six of spades. Um, we're mixing pots in about 60 size, which makes sense. The turn's like kind of a brick, right? So if we think about how we're approaching turns in general, when the turn is really good for us, we're going to be using more small bets, just pushing equity with our entire range. When the turn is extremely bad for us, we're going to have to do way more checking and be way more forward. Um, the six is kind of like a brick, right? It didn't really improve many of our draws. Uh, so it's not great for us, it's not bad for us, so we're going to be using a medium bet size, right? Some potting and some bet 60. I can even show you uh, that in the in the hotness here. Here's our turn barrel strat. Yeah, this, this spot's cool, right? Jack, 10, deuce. We check raise a lot of the top pairs. The opponent calls a lot of ace high, right? And so on aces, we just have to play a pure check strategy. Um, whereas these like lower cards are kind of bricks, um, but better for us in general because we retain that top pair advantage that we check raise in the flop. So these over cards to the jack, really, really bad for us in general. We look at OOP equity. 50% equity, but a lack of a nut advantage on the queen, where they turn more ace-king than us. Um, the ace is obviously terrible for us, and that's going to lead to these strategies we're seeing here. So in this hand, I got the six of spades, and we're going to see that this is kind of the concept I'm talking about where you need to turn uh, you need to turn equity. So queen four of diamonds is just a give up. We can't be barreling with, with that little, of, little amount of equity. Um, so you're seeing that you're, you are barreling a deuce, um, 
because you have like reasonable two pairing trips out, so it has okay equity in the spot. Uh, you also are kind of getting their pairs to fold. So when you barrel your deuce, you're making them fold twos through nines, which is kind of sick. Um, and then you're barreling your higher equity draws, like your queen nine continues to barrel. Um, queen nine here continues to barrel. Your marginal hands that you raise in the flop, like when you raise king 10 for thin value, that kind of gets downgraded because we just condense their range. So we're doing a lot of checking with that hand type. Um, and then if we look at our spades here, our spades are just putting in more money, right? We turned equity, boom, there's our rule. It's kind of like our game theory trigger. We're like, okay, check raise a solid strategy on the flop, turn equity, barrel the turn. So in this spot, I barrel the turn for a two thirds bet size. The opponent calls. And we get to the river of the eight of diamonds. So now we have a really interesting decision um, on the eight. We need to think about what our overall range looks like here. Um, obviously, like our high equity straight bluffs got there, right? Like, like we have queen nine, so we did river some amount of new nut hands. Um, and our jack is still really strong. So we're still going to be um, betting a lot of our jacks for an all-in size here, uh, which might seem thin, but against really good players, they're going to find uh, enough calls of course that um, when you have the, the queen jack here, you, you're just saying all in. Um, if you get cool, it, you get cool. So when you think about where our bluff should come from, and in general, having spades in this river doesn't seem great, right? Like if we think about when you're approaching river bluffing, you want to block their value hands and unblock their auto folds. And so if we think about this river, well, a few auto folds they have are just their king high of spades that turned equity, right? So if they had king eight of or king five of spades they have to flip flop with the back to flush draw on the overcard they have to call the turn of the flush draw and they're going to fold to any bet size so we are blocking some auto folds which isn't great but because the eight brings um more nutted hands for us and our jack is still worth a lot we need to find bluffs um, and we don't have enough combos of do sets to bluff with that this hand is going to fall into a bluff uh, at a really high frequency so I go all in, and uh, we get fortunate to, to find the fold here. But let's look at that in the solver. And so in this spot, um, obviously you have less than pop back. You have like 60% pop back. I mostly just play an all in or check strategy here. I I'm I'm not really finding a a smaller bet size here with the one with with the 149. It's made up of thin value bets to your jack, which makes sense. Maybe I would find some of this. Um, pretty hard to bluff for this small size. It feels like you just want to sail in and, and try to like target their 10x to, to find some folds. So um, you can see that king jack, queen jack, we are just saying all in most of the time. Our deuce x is bluffing, which makes sense, right? We're blocking some of their value um, with the like, pocket deuces type stuff. Uh, we're also blocking straights, which is now huge. This is kind of why we use this hand type. It gives us forward coverage on like straight completing rivers and turns. Um, deuce nine is blocking the straight, right? That's huge. Um, same with queen deuce. So we're bluffing these hands. And then we see that our king three and our spade draws are bluffing in this spot. And we don't love it, right? It, it's not great blocking their auto folds, but we just don't have um, a ton of board coverage on a runout like this, such that we can have a like, perfect bluffing canvas on, on every street. So we go all in. Uh, here's their auto folds, right? These king highs that are going to auto fold. But what we're targeting with this are their 10x. So we're essentially targeting their king 10 0, uh, their low suited 10s. Also, ace king, ace queen, high folding is, is, is pretty nice. So um, overall, pretty happy with this hand. Hopefully, that helps you um, develop strong check raising strategies as well as understanding when to barrel the turn. Um, we'll keep working on like rare strategies and some of the, and, and some of the other hands. So uh, we, can, we can talk more on that. The last thing I want to say about this hand is uh, at the start of the video, I mentioned how difficult it is to defend a really wide range. And I think this is a really good example of it because if we look at this bet 25, raise 85, you have to peel so much. Like, you just do have to peel all your king high backdoor flush draws. Excuse me, king 4, king 5, all your ace high backdoor flush draws. And then you get barreled for about 60 on the turn. You're just not folding that much, you know? You're still calling a queen, a king high. Um, you're never folding a ten unless it has bad blockers like ten nine, ten eight. 
that are blocking some of my bluffs, right? Uh, folding threes through nines, but in route you have to fight really hard for pots here. And then with 40 big blinds deep in, in, a, in a big event, and you get check raised, you get barreled for about 60, and then you get jammed down on the river, and you just have to look at your jack three, and it's worth a lot. It's like a snap call in this spot. Um, and then you have to mix calls, do 10-3, 10-4, 10-7, uh, etc. So in general, I think these spots are really, really difficult to defend against. Um, so I would, I would really look to be very aggressive from the big blind against wide ranges. Um, use some of those concepts we talked about uh, for developing strong block and turn strategies. Uh, and then kind of just say good luck to your opponent. I mean, they have, they have to defend really wide. Um, they have to defend some ugly, ugly hands on turns and rivers in, in, in these spots with a wide range. So, uh, yeah, this is a fun one. Uh, let's move on to the next hand. I hope that you're enjoying this, this high-stakes pile review from poker coaching coach Justin Saliba. I actually have another part of this series that I'm happy to release for all of you here on YouTube. I just need one quick favor from you. I need you to smash that subscribe button below. If we get 100 new subscribers from this video, I'll release part two. Good luck and enjoy the rest of the video. So this next chance is gonna come from a recent Bellagio 10K. Uh, opened eight six of straight from the hijack. Big blind player defends king seven two rainbow. Uh, this flop is just a extremely good flop for the imposition player. So you're just going to bet small with your entire range. If you have a lot of pot share, you're going to over realize your equity position here. Um, and so the way these spots typically operate is you bet small on the flop, pushing your equity advantage. The big blind is going to fold all their air. That's going to cause equities to be a lot closer on the turn. And then you're going to need to be uh, a lot more polarized on the turn using a lot of big bets. So you bet your whole range on the flop, the opponent calls, and now we come to our, a real decision point here on what to do on the queen of diamonds. So the reason why I chose uh, this specific hand is that in the last time we talked about how when you're OOP, you have to have equity to barrel the turn. Uh, but that is a lot different than when you're in position here, because when you're in position, you actually want to have a lot of no equity bluffs. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you're in position, you get to check back and realize all of your equity. So if you have um, jack 10 of hearts here, you don't want to barrel every time because at some frequency you're going to get jammed on. And when you get jammed on by hand like ace five diamonds, it's really, really crappy to have to fold out your equity, right? So when you're in position, you have the added benefit that you can check and realize your equity. Uh, that means that you're going to want to do that at some frequency, and then you should pull your bluffs more from your no equity region of hands. Um, so what makes a good no equity bluff? Well, the goal on the turn in these spots is that you want to unblock your opponent's folds. So we bet really small on the flop, the opponent called, and we get the queen of diamonds. So when we barrel for a big size here, what are we targeting? What are we trying to make the opponent fold? Well, a huge portion of their range is going to be ace highs, and then we're targeting their sevens and twos that didn't turn a backdoor flush draw, right? And so this eight six is going to fit really nicely into that, in that we're unblocking uh, a huge portion of that folding range, right? So I go ahead and I bet pot on the turn, the opponent calls, and then we get the five hearts, kind of a brick on the river, and I jam, the opponent calls. Uh, it's going to be hard to win this one with, with eight six. so when the opponent calls. So we end up losing this hand, but let's look at it in Pio and uh, take away some, some things you guys can use on a lot of different boards. So king seven deuce, check. Here's the small bet strategy. These king high disconnected boards, you're going to see that we have an extremely big equity advantage and an even bigger... Um, pot share. So we go ahead and bet small, and then the turn is the queen of diamonds. This is really the decision point. Uh, we're pushing equity on the flop, and then because we're going to be more polar on the turn, we're going to have a really clear region of marginal hands to check. And you can see that through our pocket pairs, jacks through age threes through sixes, uh, our queen x middle pair type stuff, our seven x middle pair type stuff. Um, very clear checking region, right? And then our value is going to come from, I mean, even our weak kings, right? Weak kings are going to be marginal here. Um, so our value region is going to come from, like, king nine and better, essentially. Uh, and then a smattering of bluffs. So it's like, okay, where do we pull the bluffs from? Well, one rule of thumb is if you're used to looking at a hand grid, 
the way this spot's going to operate is as you open more hands, so like as you go from hijack to button, you're going to have more of your suited kings, suited jacks, etc. You want to choose the region of hands in this region here that interacts with the board the least. And those hands are going to be your no equity bluffs on turns in a lot of these turn barrel spots. So if we think about our number one hand that interacts with our opponents with the board the least, it's going to be 5-4, right? 5-4 is a nothing hand. 5-4 part two, and it's a perfect turn barrel when we're in position. Uh, because when we pot here, we're not interacting with any of the opponents forward, which is which is awesome. We're just going to make them fold so many ace highs uh, and 7x here. Uh, and, and we don't need the equity, right? So you're going to see Jack-10 does a lot more checking. A hand like Ace-9 of Diamonds is a perfect example, right? If we pot Ace-9 of Diamonds, we're making the opponent fold 8-6 of Diamonds, right? We pot they fold 8-6 of diamonds, okay? So we're making them fold a lot of ace highs that are worse than us. We're making them fold worse diamond draws than us. It's like, that's not really where we want to be. We'd much rather just prefer to, or we much prefer to check, realize our equity, cooler the diamonds on diamond rivers, cooler the worst ace sex on ace rivers, and then have equity with the nine, right? And just show down value in general. So you don't always need to turn equity when you're in position. You more so want to focus on your low equity bluffs, so the 5-4, the 6-5, the 8-6, the 9-6, right? The jack-8. All these hands are very low equity hands, but they do a really nice job of unblocking the opponent's folding range. Uh, and so they're going to be used a lot as in-position turn barrels. So hopefully this is showing the difference between in-position turn barreling and out-of-position turn barreling, where we have to have equity out of position. Uh, in position, you just don't need it. So we pot. In the opponent fault. And that doesn't mean you're not going to barrel any, right? So, like, your ace four of diamonds makes a lot of sense. Your ace four in general makes a lot of sense to barrel turn for big size because you're making all their all the better ace sectors full. It gives you cleaner outs on uh, an ace river, and you're unblocking more diamond draws that continue, right? So, yeah, you're making ace 10 0 full. That's a huge win for ace four suited or a ace four uh, even of hearts, right? So, you're barreling these aces way more. Um, than like your ace-10, ace-9 type stuff. Even though ace-10 and ace-9 look like a draw, right? It looks like a hand that you would want to barrel. When you're in position, you get to just check back and realize your equity. So we go with the barrel on the turn, and then we're going to get a low blank on the river, the five hearts. We go for the jam. So we want to be thinking again about how we should construct our river, where, our river, where we should pull our river bluffs from, right? And I want you to think about what the worst hand, what the worst card in the deck to hold is uh, on the river. So gave you maybe seven seconds. The worst card in the deck is going to be the Ace of Diamonds, right? Ace of Diamonds is going to block the opponent's auto folds. We bet Tiny on the flop, they call it. They turn it back to a flush draw. What is the number one auto fold on the river? It's going to be their ace high of diamonds, right? When they have ace nine of diamonds, things like that. So we're actually not going to bluff our diamonds very much here. As you can see, ace four of diamonds plays a pure check. We are blocking their auto folds. That's terrible when we're river bluffing, right? Whereas if you compare it to our lower diamonds, you're finding a little bit more bluffs, right? But even your jack high diamonds is not good enough. You just have to check back and lose. And it doesn't feel good, right? You, you take jack eight of diamonds, bet flop, you bet turn, you shouldn't have jack high in the river. But the bottom line is you have really bad card removal. It's a really, it's two really bad cards to hold in your hand. Uh, because when you jam, you're blocking the ace jack of diamonds, you're blocking the ace eight of diamonds. These are pure folds, right? So river bluffing is all about blockers. And our hand, the eight six of spades, fits perfectly into a river bluff. We have eight high, so we benefit a ton from bluffing our hand and getting anything to fold. And we're not blocking any of the folds, really, right? When we have 8-6 of spades. Um, as we talked about earlier, the 8-6 time is still bluffing here because it's blocking many fewer of uh, of the opponent's folds than, like, the jack-high ones. But when you have the ace 3 of clubs, it's a perfect hand to bluff off with here because you're unblocking all the opponent's folding range. Um, so hopefully that shows you how to approach turn barreling, uh, turn range construction when you're in position. And then another example of how to structure your river bluffing range. All right, the last hand, uh, part one, we're going to go back to a OOP big blind spot.
uh, the button play raisins from a recent uh, 15k from a few days ago um, called the 5-3 offsuit we get queen 6-6 six, six, rainbow check check turn offsuit 4 so I think that this hand fits nicely into uh, what we've been talking about over the previous two hands because it's a really good example of how um, OOP you're going to mostly just want to have equity when you you know we talk about barreling the turn with check raise how you want equity when you put money in the pot the same thing happens with turn probes um, and so most of your range is going to want to have extra equity because you're out of position uh, putting a lot of money in the pot. So if we think about what that size we want to use when probing this turn, well, what, what does our value feel like it wants to, how much money does our value want to put in? Are we going to be really polar or is the board so good for us that we're going to be betting small? Well, in this spot, we're going to be really polar, right? Because when we bet, we're saying I have a six or I have a queen, right? We're not going to, we don't have a huge portion of value of like middling equity hands. We either kind of have air or we have a pretty strong hand. Um, so I'm sure we're still going to get some bet 25 with like weaker queen X or some low fours that want some protection. Um, but in general, our sixes want to go for a really big size here. So when we put a lot of money in the pot, OOP, we need to have equity, right? Uh, and so we're going to see that in the solver, um, especially with, if, if we think about um, like, like proper runouts and proper high EV rivers, we want to have a heart in our hand when, when we're betting, right? If if we have 5-3-0 oh, no heart, we have less high EV rivers that we're going to get to bluff on, right? Whereas if we have 5-3-0 oh, with a heart, we're going to get to bluff on more runouts, more and more rivers in this situation. Uh, so having a heart can be really nice in the spot. Plus, uh, so even though it's not added equity, we're going to have uh, more high EV rivers. So that's going to turn this hand into a really high frequency turn pro. So I go with the pot size bet, the opponent calls. Let's look at that decision point in the solver. Uh, so we have check, really heavy check board for imposition, massive offsuit six disadvantage. Um, and we get the four of spades. Here's the offsuit sixes I was talking about. Um, and you see that our sixes want to put a lot of money in the pot. Now we're going to have some sixes that don't want to put a lot of money in the pot, and that's going to be like queen six when we're blocking their top pairs, right? Um, and a six, the Fun thing about a6 is, one, we get to cooler their ace highs when it goes check check, and two, when you have an ace in your hand, um, you're blocking your opponent's turn checkbacks, right? So it weights them slightly to having more non-ace high hands, which means they're going to bluff versus your check slightly more often than, for example, when you have 10-6, right? Uh, so that's why the ace-6 finds checks, the queen-6 finds small bets in check, and then most of your other six want to put a lot of money in the pot. And then you're still getting some bet 25 that we talked about with like decent queen x, some fours that want protection, uh, etc. And then if we think about where your bluff should come from, well, the rule is, okay, we need equity, right? So our first bluffs are going to come from where? They're going to come from our flush draws. They have the most equity. So we look at our hearts, and all of our non shutdown value hearts are putting money in the pot, like a huge portion of them, right? These have the pair of fours with them, so they have shutdown value. Ace high is shutdown value. Good king high is shutdown value. Um, so our hearts are a big place where we're drawing our bluffs from. Another place is going to be coming from our draw, our straight draws, right? So you have your 5-7, you have your 5-3s. Um, now, we talked about high EV rivers. Here's how, here's where you can see that when you have a heart in your hand, you're going to barrel at a higher frequency because you get to bluff more rivers, right? Uh, so you're seeing pure bluffs with the 5-3 with the heart and mixing with, with the rest of them. Now, you need to find a, a few other bluffs in the spot. And so our typical rule where it's like you have equity on OOP, you can barrel that hand as a bluff. It still is true, but in this spot, you need some board coverage. Uh, and so you do take your best blocker type hands, which which makes some sense, right? Because say you only bet uh, your straight draws, your flush draws, and your trips for pot size bet, right? What are you going to bluff with on the seven of hearts? Right? You're going to have so many nut hands. And, and not enough to bluff with. Uh, and so when it goes check, check, the opponent does have more air, which means you don't have to be quite as choosy with what you're barreling with. And so one of your best blocker hands here, it's going to be high hearts with a low card that's unblocking stuff. So you have like uh, your king 2-0 here. Your king 2-0 with the heart, uh, it gets to bluff at some frequency because the heart allows you board coverage on a heart river, allows you to bluff those, uh, bluff those runs at high frequency. Your two 
is unblocking all the middling cards that the button has. So like when you pot the spot, look at all these offsuit hands that are folding, right? All the better king X are folding. All these better ace X are folding when you pot. So you're getting you're you're unblocking all of these middling hands when you have a two in your hand. It's just like a really uh, typical best blocker hand to have here. So that's the only kind of exception to the spot of you need equity in the spot to barrel. You're not not barrel in the spot. You're probing in the spot. But um, yeah, so we go with the pot size bet here. I hope that makes sense on on why our strategy is that way. The opponent calls on the river. We get the nine of spades. So. Here's our second decision point in the hand. All right, so what do we do here? Well, let's think about how our blockers interact with the runout. Is the nine good for our range or bad for our range? Well, I'm going to say it's pretty freaking bad for us, right? For our overall strategy. On the turn, we're betting a lot of high equity stuff in sixes. So our sixes are still the nuts, but none of our high equity stuff improved, right? I mean, our nines with a heart made a nine. That's it. Uh, high equity turns would be like, or high equity rulers would be like a three, um, a five, a seven, a heart. Especially like the ace of hearts would be an incredibly good card for us, right? Because um, we are bluffing with all of our lower hearts, and so we make so many flushes on the river. Uh, but the nine is kind of a brick. And so <clears throat> even though we have five high here, we don't actually have really good blockers to any value hands. Um, our five hearts isn't great here because it's blocking some of the opponent's auto folds that don't bet flop, call the big turn bet, and then would fold the river, such as um, king five hearts, for example. Uh, and so we actually don't have a great bluffing candidate here. We'd much rather bluff with our seven five clubs here uh, than our five three with a heart in it. So let's see that in the solver um, and, and make sure that, that that's correct. It's the nine of spades. And so we're, we're extremely polar here, right? Because it's not a good card for us. It's a brick. Our six is still the nuts, but it didn't improve any of our uh, any of our bluffs on the turn. And so we're extremely polar here. Our only size is almost 2x pot here with all of our king x. And so let's think about how our hearts are going to do on the river. Well, our hearts are giving up, right? Our hearts are pure checking. They have bad blockers on the river. We look at the 5-3-0. When we have a heart, it's a lower frequency, especially the five hearts. Because they are auto-folding. They actually have to find some calls. They spot ace high with ace five hearts because we're never blocking with that card, right? But in general, all these five heart hands are auto-folding. So our five hearts are really, really bad blocking. Let's think about what would be a good blocking candidate here. Well, a two or a three in our hand we know is a good thing. Because we're unblocking the most amount the imposter player can have. And then we don't want to have hearts. Let's look at like clubs. Five deuce of clubs, pure all in. Right? We're not blocking any folds. It's a perfect hand to just run it with. Um, king of clubs, deuce. Right? The deuce of hearts is way uh, less bad for us because they have way fewer deuce of hearts in their range. Then they do five parts in their end, right? So on this river, we have to be really disciplined here. I definitely had an issue <clears throat> for a long time. It's still difficult to pot the turn and then check five high on the river, right? It's 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 a uh, it's a funny thing, but when you're really trying to play at a high level, um, you're just going to be thinking about how does my hand fit into my range? Okay, the nine means that I have to be polar in the spot, really really polar. And if I'm going to be polar, I have to have my best bluffing candidates because I don't get to bluff a ton of runouts. Um, so hopefully that shows more on the turn probing and also on choosing river bluffing candidates. Uh, I want to look at a good river to look at betting frequency and our polarity, right? So like if we get any heart here, look at our betting frequency, right? Our betting frequency is infinitely higher because if you think about our overall turn strategy, we improve with so many of our bluffs that we get to bet at a way higher frequency in general. So now our 5-3, boom, we find pure bluffs with it when we have the heart, and that, and that makes sense. How okay. about a non-heart low card? A non-heart low card is way better for us because some of our straight draws get in. So we're still very polar, but our frequency goes up, right? Our betting frequency in the 7 of hearts is like, you know, 32% checks versus the 9, 
56 percent check right so it's all about thinking um about how the rivers affect our overall turn range and then using that to decide okay what's my frequency going to be what's my size going to be and how do my hands fit into my overall range so i hope this video uh helps you guys play these op and imposition barrel or probe spots better uh, and i hope this helps you uh you know decide river bluffing frequencies and uh, river bluffing candidates so thanks guys um looking forward to part two talk soon bye